of those uh, who have gone through severe cases of COVID-19 are starting to come out, starting to hear some reports that people are giving. Like from Karen Bischoff, who is 30, 30 years old, a former firefighter and a, par a paramedic from Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, she spent four weeks in, into her battle with the virus. She reports this, I feel helpless. Before I went to the gym five or six days a week, now a flight of stairs exhausts me. I can't play soccer, ride bikes, or go to the pool with my son. I feel so much mom guilt, like I'm an absent mom. I'm unemployed and I don't know what kind of work I will be able to tolerate in the future. Or how about from Bilal Quizelbosch, who's 34, he's a CEO in Jackson, Mississippi. He was diagnosed in May and spent a month in the hospital in the ICU. Even now, he reports, the amount of pain I've experienced is shocking. It almost feels like a bioweapon. Sometimes I have to take a break from work to lie down and, and lie down in the fetal position. The pain is so distracting, I make mistakes in my job and rely on my team to check my work. I'd say I'm only functioning about 40%. But then there's LaToya Henry, age 43, a public relations and a communications specialist from Lathrop Village, Michigan. Uh, she had no pre-existing conditions, yet she was, had to be hospitalized and on a ventilator for two weeks. And she writes this even after that. Months later, I'm still not totally back to normal. My balance feels off and I have intermittent chest congestion. I have also been diagnosed with irregular heartbeat, and on top of all the physical t symptoms, it's mentally hard too. I was so afraid I'd have to go back to the hospital. You know, I share these not as, uh, as not to scare you or as any kind of propaganda. Thankfully, the statistics are still very low on those that have had to suffer in this way. Uh, there are many more stories besides these that, that have been told. Uh, the ones that we read here, these firsthand uh, experiences, though, there, there's a common thread that runs through all of them. Uh, the virus and, and all of them has brought a painful awareness and a sense of helplessness. I don't think you had to have uh, had the coronavirus to be able to relate to that same feeling, that at some point, there was or is or will be a time uh, when there's nothing you can do to help yourself. Most of us are living through this pandemic, I think are dealing with that overwhelming sense, that sense of helplessness. It's the reason why life as we know it has been shut down and altered. But the truth is this sense uh, of being helpless, it's not unique to this pandemic. We all have lived through events and circumstances in our lives where we were made painfully aware of our inability uh, or our powerlessness to be able to help ourselves. Most of the time, I think we run around with a false sense of, of power and control. We like to think that we can overcome all odds and all possible challenges that are ever uh, before us. But inevitably, at some point, something comes along it's beyond our power. And the darkness and despair of helplessness comes rushing into our lives. I had one of these uh, painful reminders this past week. Uh, that's why I wasn't with you this past Sunday. Our son, Chess, had a really bad earache. And so we went to a minute clinic uh, thinking that it was just a minor problem that would require some minor uh, medication. Uh, well, that trip then led us on to Wolfson's emergency room where Chess was admitted for fear of a mastoiditis. Uh, if you don't know what that is, neither did I. Uh, but uh, it's real and it's not real fun if you look it up, but what it's about. There's nothing that makes you feel more helpless than having to watch your child suffer and be in pain. And there's nothing you can do about it. You take it away if you could, but you can't. Praise the Lord in Chess's case, after uh, all the tests and after uh, giving him enough medication, it was not mastoiditis and, uh, and the medicines have worked and he's doing fine now. Uh, but none of us likes that feeling, I know I don't, uh, of, of helplessness. 
Yet it's only when we truly and fully realize and embrace and accept our own helplessness that we can truly find the joy and the hope of the gospel. It's only when we accept our own helplessness that the the gospel then truly becomes good news to us in our lives. You know, Jesus said this. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. See, our moments of helplessness, they actually point us to the fact that we're sick. We're not right. We do not have the power or the ability to help ourselves. In our reading this morning from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28, it illustrates this very reality. And it actually gives us help and hope in the midst of our own helplessness. And so I want to invite you to open up your Bibles, or if you open up that bulletin that uh, we sent you, hopefully you got it online. Uh, We're going to work through this together this morning. And in the process, we're going to find help and hope for those times which are always that we are in such desperate need. In verse 21, we're told this, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. You know, the great uh, college football coach Lou Holtz uh, once said, In the successful organization, no detail is too small to escape close attention. Football coaches are obsessed with every detail, just finding any little thing that will possibly give them success. Well, attention to detail is incredibly important as well when we're looking at the Word of God. Every detail matters. And the fact that Jesus went to the district of Tyre and to Sidon is very, a very important detail. Jesus had been teaching, he had been preaching, and he had been healing in the region of Galilee. Sidon and Tyre were located to the west along the the Mediterranean Sea. And this was not the first time that that we hear of Tyre and Sidon in the Bible. Uh, Going all the way back to the book of Joshua, we learn of them because the tribe of Asher, God's chosen people, failed to obey God's commands and to push the inhabitants of those cities out of the promised land. They got there and they looked and they said, they're too well fortified, we just can't do it. And as a result, God told them that he would leave them there, the people of Tyre and Sidon, that they would be a thorn in their side forever. These were pagan cities. They worshiped false gods. In the book of Judges, we're also told about the peop- that the people of Israel turned from God and they turned to the false gods of Sidon. In 1 Kings, we're told about the most wicked queen in all of the history of Israel, and that was Jezebel. Well, she was a princess of Sidon. So when, we to- when we're told that Jesus went to the district of Tyre and Sidon, it's an important detail. It's a really important detail because we're being told that Jesus went into a pagan culture. And then in verse 22, we're told this, And behold... A Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. So while Jesus was in this pagan region, a Canaanite woman came to him. She was a Canaanite because she was a descendant of the people of Canaan that God had ordered to be driven out, but that his people had failed to do so. She was a pagan woman from a pagan culture. One of the ones that God warned would be a thorn in their side. But listen again to what this pagan woman, what she cried out to Jesus about. She said, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. See, there's a lot to understand about this woman from this very, very short entreaty that she offers to Jesus. First of all, she came to Jesus looking for mercy. That's what she wanted. She was crying for mercy. You know, we usually think of mercy as an act of kindness towards someone. Uh, But the word that's used here means really much more than that. Uh, The word means to show compassion or forgiveness as God defines it. 
in accordance with his truth. Why does that make much of a difference here? This pagan woman was not merely looking for Jesus to be kind to her. She just didn't need uh, someone to be nice that day. She was appealing to God's truth in a desperate moment of need in her life. The second thing to notice here is that this pagan woman asked for Jesus to have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. You know, it was her daughter who was suffering from a demon oppression. It wasn't her. It would have made far more sense here for her to have asked uh, Jesus to have mercy on her daughter. So why does she ask to have mercy on her? I think this is the first indication we get about what this woman is really going through. She was helpless. She was in total despair. Her daughter was suffering and there was nothing that she could do about it. In other words, she was desperate. She had nowhere else to turn for help. It was killing her. It was eating her up inside. And so this Canaanite woman was appealing to God's truth for help and has recognized her own helplessness and desperation for Jesus to help her. But thirdly, she called Jesus Lord, Son of David. Lord, Son of David. See, she didn't just recognize Jesus as this uh, famous healer who was traveling throughout the land, uh, a miracle worker. Goodness knows she probably had been to her fair share of those so-called healers and miracle workers, uh, but none of it had worked. It was all to no avail. She addresses Jesus as Lord, Son of David, which means she's acknowledged Jesus as being authority and master. That's what Lord means, to be a, have authority and be master over her. And his purpose, she also acknowledges as he is the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. That's what the Son of David means, the promised one from God. God had made a covenant with David and promised that his kingdom would last forever. It's important to notice that Jesus had just been in Israel right before this. He had been in Israel with the Pharisees who were considered to be the most holiest, the most highest and religious of all of God's chosen people. But they could not bring themselves to admit or confess what this desperate pagan woman has just confessed about herself and about Jesus. meant that they needed mercy, that they needed help desperately, that Jesus was the Savior sent from God for them. Yet here in God's, in this God-forsaken region that had long lived in disobedience to God, Jesus found a true confession of faith, which makes verse 23 all the more odd. This is what we're told in verse 23, but Jesus did not answer her a word. He was silent. Why? Why? Did he not care? Did he not want to be bothered with her in this moment? Did he have more important things maybe to do? I know sometimes we may feel about like that in our own lives when we're in times of helplessness and desperation that, you know, God, maybe God doesn't really care. Maybe he's got other bigger things, bigger fish to fry that he doesn't care about us so much. Well, the truth is we're not really given the reason yet. What we do know is that she didn't give up. She didn't give in to Jesus' silence. It didn't dissuade her. She continued to cry out until the point that the disciples got so annoyed with this woman looking for mercy from Jesus that they begged Jesus, send her away. If you're just going to stay silent, if you're not going to do anything, send this woman away from us. She's driving us nuts. Finally, in verse 24, Jesus gives us the answer. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The reason Jesus didn't respond was because his mission was first and foremost to God's chosen people. But this woman was so desperate that even given Jesus' rejection here, we're told in verse 25 that she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. 
Can you just hear the, the, the cries of desperation that this woman was feeling? Notice that she didn't argue. She didn't get angry about Jesus' rejection. She simply and she humbly submitted. She knelt down before him. She submitted to the only one she knew who could possibly help her. And with that, Jesus doubled down. And he answered her in verse 26. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Talk about adding insult to injury here. See, now Jesus is calling her a dog. Now, it's, this was a common insult that was given by God's uh, chosen people to those who were outside the covenant. Yet again, this woman does not argue. She doesn't get offended. She simply says in verse 27, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You know, David... Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a great 20th century preacher and teacher and evangelist, uh, he said this, when a person truly sees themselves, they know that nobody can say anything about them that is too bad. What he was saying is that when we truly know ourselves, then we know how sinful and rebellious our hearts truly are. And when we know that, there's nothing that anyone could ever possibly say about us that's worse than what is probably really true in our hearts in the first place. Albert Einstein once said, only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the former. Do you feel insulted? <laughs> Maybe a little bit? Or do you think that he was probably just talking about someone else? Probably more likely, right? See, when we know how sinful we are, even in our best actions and our best thoughts and our best desires, there's nothing that anyone could possibly say that is bad as what we truly are at heart. This pagan Canaanite woman, she knew her own sinfulness. She knew her own helpless state and that even the least of what Jesus could give her would be more than she could ever possibly find on her own. And with that, Jesus said to her in verse 28, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed immediately. See, this woman was desperate. This woman was helpless. She knew the depths of her own depravity, her unworthiness to come before Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and ask him for anything. And yet, in her desperate helpless and humble state, what she found was the grace and mercy and help that she really needed. Friends, if you're not already painfully aware, we are a helpless people. We're powerless to control the world and even our own health and well-being. We're unworthy because of our sin to ask God for anything, let, uh, let alone uh, help and salvation. We are in desperate need. We are this Canaanite woman. If you can accept that truth about yourself, then the gospel truly becomes good news for you. To quote again uh, from David Martin Lloyd-Jones from his book, The Path to True Happiness, uh, he wrote this, There is nothing more wonderful than when you have been hiding yourself from Jesus, as it were, afraid to look at him, but at last, in desperation, you just have to look up and you see the most surprising thing you have ever seen. There's a look of love. There's a look of compassion and of mercy and of pity and of welcome. And you see the greatest invitation, come. And you go back to him filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's what this Canaanite woman found that's what awaits us when we accept this invitation and come in our helplessness and our desperation to Jesus. Friends, don't let your feelings right now of helplessness enslave you to fear. Take that helplessness and cry out to Jesus and find in him salvation for your souls and joy, a joy that is everlasting. Amen.